Delighted that you're here and hope you've got your Bible with you and encourage you to get it and let's turn to some things in the Old Testament. You might be turning to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Has anyone ever told you that you were a pain? Has anybody just, maybe a friend or brother or family member, you're nothing but a pain is what you are. Well, maybe as a kid, someone told you that. Were you ever given the nickname Pain? That would even be worse if that was your nickname and they just called you Pain. Even worse than that would be if your own mother named you Pain. What if that was given by your mother from birth? Your name meant Pain. Well, the Bible tells us about such a man. He was named Pain. It's only mentioned once in the Bible, relatively unknown. We know very little about the man other than what two verses may tell us. What we do know about him is a prayer that he offered. And that's about all that we know about the man. His name was Jabez. So let's look at chapter 4 of 1 Chronicles. The only place where he's mentioned. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And what we know about him is found right here, found on the screen before you and found in your text. And it's often referred to as the prayer of Jabez. Now what's interesting is to note, and we'll come to this a little bit later, we're not interested right now, is the context in which it sets. It doesn't seem to fit. I'll say more about that in a moment. The text says, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez because I bore him in pain. Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. That's the story. That's the entire story about Jabez. Now, taking those two verses, that's the only place where he's mentioned. He's not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. He's not mentioned in reference back from another writer of the Old Testament. He's easily overlooked and perhaps missed in our Bible reading or maybe in our Bible study because, as one writer put it, his name is located in a dry mass of dead names. So if you're not already open, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. And I want you to notice what you see in the first nine chapters. In the first nine chapters, this is if you were doing daily Bible reading, come to 1 Chronicles, you'd have a tendency to scan over Because you read about the family of Adam and Seth to Abraham. You read of the the family of Isaac, the family of Seir, the family of Israel, the family of Herzon, uh, the family of Reuben in chapter 5. You just see name after name after name after name that we do not know who these people are, nor do we know how to pronounce the names. And right in the middle of chapter 4, all of a sudden you see, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez because... I bore him in pain. And it says he called upon his God and he prayed and tells us what he prayed and said God gave him the request of his prayer. Then we go back to name after name after name after name. And he's correct, whoever it was that said, his name is located in a dry mass of dead names. You look over that, you miss that. And you wonder why the writer put that here in this context. His name must have been well known to those to whom Chronicles was intended because not much explanation is given as to who he was and the significance of who he was. Jabez was the name of a town, according to chapter 2 and verse 55, perhaps named after him because he was such an honorable man, though we do not know that for sure. What little we do know about him, which is found right here in our text, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, 9, and 10. You might put a marker there because we're going to spend our time in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. What little we do know about him encourages us, and it's worthy of our uh, attention. It's worthy of us giving some attention to Jabez's prayer particularly 
because it's going to serve as an encouragement to us. Perhaps the name sounds familiar because of Bruce Wilkinson's popular book that brought attention to Jabez about 22 years ago. Jabez was talked about before then, but it seems that that popular book by Bruce Wilkinson, The Prayer of Jabez, sold a great number of copies and began to give more attention to that. Now, before you rush out and buy the book, it's not worth you buying. I recently bought it, read it in preparation for this to see what he had to say, and there's a great deal of error found in the book. He talks about praying and God giving us miracles. He leaves the impression that you can pray for anything and God's going to do what you ask. Not that he may do that or he may say no, but he's going to do what you ask. Even if you're running late for your airplane and you pray that the plane will be delayed so you can catch your plane, that's probably going to happen. And or will happen if you pray for that. More of his evidence is subjective than it is biblical. His evidence that God does that is he prayed for this and it happened and he prayed for something else and it happened. So it worked for me, it'll work for you. That's what his book is about. So don't go out and buy the book. It's not worth the price. But what I want to suggest to you is that that book started a religious marketing phenomenon so that you go into religious bookstores in the early 2000s and you found all kinds of t-shirts and cups and mugs and keychains that all had either just the prayer of Jabez written on it or the prayer itself listed. And if you were unfamiliar with the book or familiar with the text, you had no clue what is the prayer of Jabez. So let's talk about the prayer of Jabez. I'm not interested in Wilkinson's take on that. I'm interested in what I find in the text. What is the prayer of Jabez? And let's start with this, though. Let's talk about the man Jabez himself and what we do know about him. What do we know about him found right here in our text? Well, first of all, I want to suggest that he was named because of pain. In reading in the New King James, if you'll find in the King James, New King James rather, where the name is mentioned at verse 9, that his mother called his name Jabez, you'll find a footnote in some translations, the New King James. And the footnote in the New King James says that the name means he will cause pain. He caused pain and he will cause pain. That's what his name means. So that's why I said his mother named him pain. He will cause pain pain. Whatever it was that she experienced in her birth of Jabez, there were other brothers, the text says, there were other children. It must have been far more than the normal pain of childbirth because she didn't name her other children Jabez. There's something unique about this one. Some suggested it may have been that the delivery was traumatic, more so than any of the other children she had. And therefore she said he will cause pain because he caused me pain. Others speculate maybe it was the pain that, was, that she experienced was more emotional than physical, whatever that may have entailed. Some have speculated, and it is pure speculation, that it may have been the father had left by the time this child was born, or maybe the father had died when this child was born, and so therefore there was an emotional pain. Maybe so, I don't know. Something about his birth was traumatic, and he will cause pain. Usually the sorrow appointed and associated with birth soon is afterward forgotten. The mother who goes through pain soon forgets that because of the joy of having the child. But there's some reason she wanted to remember this. And so she named him Jabez. Perhaps she wanted to remember God bringing her through this extraordinary experience. Maybe it was so traumatic. God helped her through that. And I want to remember God helping me through this pain. Maybe that's what she wanted. Or it may be that she wanted to teach young Jabez, your life will be, be much like your birth. What you can expect out of life is like Job said, it's, it's a few days in full of trouble. You're going to cause pain. You're going to live in pain. Maybe that's what she was wanting to do. Whatever it was, there was something about the birth of this child she wanted him to remember as well as she remembered, and thus she named him Jabez. His name means pain. Secondly, I want you to notice this text indicates in these two verses that he overcame his difficulty. In other words, I want you to notice he did not allow this to make him a coward who would wallow in a pool of self-pity. Look what my mother named me. She called me a pain. She named me pain. She said I would cause pain. No indication that he wallowed in self-pity. It didn't seem that he focused all of his attention on how terrible he had been done. 
how he had been mistreated by his own mother, and therefore that's an explanation and a justification for his lack of diligence to God. Quite often someone doesn't live like they should, and when you talk to them, why aren't you doing better? You don't understand my experience, what I experienced in my childhood, the pain I went through, the way my parents treated me, what they did to me. And that was traumatic, and therefore I can't do what I ought to be doing. No indication Jabez did that. He didn't allow his handicap to make him hard and cruel. He didn't surrender to bitterness and hate toward man or toward God. That I hate God and I hate man because of how I was mistreated. But here's what he did do. I want you to notice in the prayer that we'll come to in just a moment, he brought his handicap to God. He remembered what his name meant. He apparently remembers whatever his mother may have told him. And in his prayer to God, he talks about pain. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. I want to suggest to you that there are people who come from past difficulties and great hardships that were able to overcome and live with those hardships and live honorably. Let's get some examples of that. Put a marker at 1 Chronicles. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Let's go over to Corinth, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When Paul came to Corinth, it was an ungodly city. The gospel had a great effect. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized, Acts 18, 8 says. Now, that's amazing that some of the Corinthians did because they were very, very immoral. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9, Paul talks about those that cannot enter into heaven and he mentions a whole catalog of people like the fornicators and the uh, idolaters and the adulterers and the homosexuals and the sodomites and the thieves and the covetous and the drunkards and the revilers and the extortioners. That's a bad class of people. And notice at verse 11 he says, and such were some of you. In other words, when the gospel came to Corinth, it was heard by those who were homosexuals, it was heard by those who were extortioners, those who were idolaters, those who were adulterers, those who were sodomites, those who were thieves, and they heard the gospel and they responded. Now notice further at verse 11, he said, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You made a complete change because of the gospel. They overcame their past. Instead of saying, you know what, we were raised as homosexuals, we can't overcome. We were raised as idolaters, we cannot overcome. They overcame and they turned from their past. Let's look at another case. And that's the case of Saul of Tarsus, Philippians chapter 3. Saul of Tarsus was raised as a Jew. He was raised as a Pharisee of Pharisees, a zealous Pharisee. He said, no one had more zeal than I had. Concerning zeal, he said, verse 6 of chapter 3, persecuting the church concerning righteousness of the law, blameless. I tried to do everything I knew to be right as far as the Jewish religion was concerned. But I want you to drop down with me to verse 13 now. Look at verse 13. He said, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead. In other words, I've learned to forget my past and turn loose of my past and reach forward to the things which are ahead. What Paul had done was he forgot about the past. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and in verse 9. This ought to be familiar because we're studying in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians this morning, we've just finished 1 Thessalonians. Notice those at Thessalonica. When the gospel came, a great multitude responded. Notice verse 9. Paul said, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. In other words, the impact the gospel had at Thessalonica. What kind of impact did it have? And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living God. Here's what I want you to see. Here were some who came, became different from what they were in the past. They were idolaters. They were heathens. They were pagans. And they turned and became New Testament Christians. And that's what I want you to notice about Jabez. Jabez, Jabez overcame his past. Here's something else about Jabez. He was an honorable man. Let's go back to our text in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 and notice in verse 9. The first thing said about him was, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. That's interesting. That refers to how God views him, by the way. 
Not that he lifted himself up and said, you know what, I'm more honorable than my brothers. But that's how God viewed him. And recorded right here in a whole list of names. Whereas if the writer is saying, oh, by the way, here's a man worthy of us mentioning that he's more honorable. There's a whole list of names in nine chapters. And the writer stops and says, this man's more honorable than his brothers. This is how God viewed him. Now let's stop for a moment to suggest that honorable people are long, long remembered. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs. Look at chapter 10. Proverbs 10 and in verse 7, <clears throat> the memory of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. Righteous people are long remembered for their righteousness. Let's turn back to the 112th Psalm. Psalm 112 and in verse 6, the text says, surely he will never be shaken, the righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. The righteous are long remembered. Well, a case in point, Jabez is long remembered. But let's go back to our text. Not only was he an honorable man, but the text says he was more honorable than his brothers. Apparently, Jabez wanted to be more and do more for God. Now you stop and think about that for a moment. He not only was an honorable man, but he was more honorable than his brothers. Again, this is how God views him, which tells me that he had the attitude, I want to be more and I want to do more for God. I don't want to do just what everybody else may be doing. He didn't have the attitude, I want to do the minimum. I want to do whatever is the least I can get by on. I want to do more and I want to be more for God. And thus the text says he was more honorable than his brothers. Let's list some qualities of an honorable man. What are some qualities of an honorable man? Well, first of all, there's a life of prayer. Evidence, that's what we know about Jabez. All we know about him really is he was an honorable man and we have his prayer re recorded. The details of his prayer, the elements of his prayer are recorded. He was a man who had a prayer life. Let's go to some New Testament passages that remind us that a righteous man, an honorable man, an honorable woman is one that has an active prayer life. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6, the text says, be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't worry about things. Things that get you all upset and uptight about life. Rather than worry and be anxious about all of that, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That's what a righteous man does. That's what an honorable man does. That's what an honorable woman does. They give their life unto prayer. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 17 and verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and in verse 17. Pray without ceasing. In other words, continue to pray. Never give up on prayer. Have a prayer life. Look at verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. In other words, those who are honorable people have a life of prayer. Let's go to 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. They deal uprightly with other people. He was more honorable than his brothers. So what would that mean? Well, in light of New Testament teaching, that would mean an application to us that we're upright in our dealings with other people. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn there with me, if you will. Verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 12. This has to do with requirements of holiness. And in verse 12, having your conduct honorable. Here's that honorable concept having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which, you, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, make sure you're dealing honorably with the, with the fellow man. Deal honorably with the Gentiles. Deal honorably even with pagans. Why do I want to deal honorably? So they have no reason and no offense against me so that they may glorify God in the day of visitation. Here's another characteristic of an honorable person. They have deep and abiding respect for God. Jabez did. In Ecclesiastes 12 and in verse 13, we see that this is the whole duty of man, to fear God and keep His commandments. To have this deep and abiding respect for God and do what He says in His will. That's the characteristic of an honorable man. 
And furthermore, he's righteous. He lives right before God. James 5 says in verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, in that, the text tells me in 1 Chronicles, God answered his prayer. That tells me Jabez was a righteous man. So what are the characteristics of a righteous, honorable person? Well, he has a life of prayer. He's upright in dealing with others. He has a deep and abiding respect for God, and he lives right. He is a righteous individual. Well, furthermore, let's talk now about his prayer. I know about Jabez himself. He was an honorable man. His name meant pain. He overcame his difficulty. But let's talk about the prayer itself. What's found in that prayer? Well, let's look at the text. I have emphasized on the screen before you the contents of his prayer. Everything else is a comment about Jabez, about how he's more honorable, his name meant pain. And he called upon God and God granted his request. But what did he say? Here's what he said. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. Well, that's not a lengthy prayer, but there's a great deal of information in that. Let's take these phrases one by one. Let's notice this first one. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. What do you pray about? Well, here's the first thing about his prayer. And he said to God, oh, that you would bless me, he said. Here's what I want you to do. My prayer and my request is that you may bless me. It's a request for personal blessing and personal favor. There is nothing wrong with asking God to bless you specifically. Some may suggest that that's selfish. I'm asking God to bless me. I'm asking God to bless me with this particular blessing. And yet we're encouraged not only in the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. Let's go to Mark chapter, or Matthew chapter 6. It's not selfish to continually ask God... I want you to bless me. In fact, we are told and we're taught by our Lord himself. This is what I want you to do. This is what we call the Lord's Prayer. This is the model prayer. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's teaching about your relationship to God in the kingdom involves praying to God. And here's what you're going to pray. Look at verse verse 9. You're going to pray beginning saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, bless me with the daily blessings. Continue to bless me with the daily blessings. That's not selfish. The Lord encourages that. And so Jabez said, bless me indeed. Now we need to ask for physical blessings. There are times that we need to go to God and we're going to ask, and that's what Matthew chapter 6 is about. Let's notice in Philippians chapter 4, we might ask God for material blessings. I want you to bless me and please and uh, bless me indeed. What are you going to bless me with? I want you to bless me with material blessings. Now in Philippians 4, Paul is writing about how the church at Philippi had sent to his necessities, supplied his physical needs, that is they'd sent money to him. And notice at verse 19, he said, oh let's back up to verse 18, indeed I have all and abound and am full and have received from Epaphroditus the things that you sent to me. So you sent the money to me and I received it and I thank God for it. Now verse 19, and may God and, and my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches uh, in glory by Jesus Christ. In other words, God will supply your needs. I'm thankful you supplied my needs. So we have every right and responsibility to ask God for physical blessings. We need to also ask God for spiritual blessings. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. This is in the conclusion of a sermon about Christ. And notice he said at verse 26, To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. In what sense would he bless you? In turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So one of the blessings would be spiritual blessings. So I might pray to God and I might ask him, bless me please with physical blessings, bless me with spiritual blessings. Now notice a word that's been added by Jabez. Go back to your text at verse 9 or verse 10. He said, oh that you would bless me indeed. That adds emphasis. In other words, bless me and bless me a lot. 
I want you to bless me with material things and bless me a lot. I want you to bless me with spiritual things and bless me a lot. In other words, it's the same as asking for God's riches blessings to be upon us. Now let's go to James chapter 4 and in verse 2. Here's one of the things I'm learning from the prayer of Jabez. And that is perhaps one reason we don't feel blessed as others is we don't ask. Maybe sometimes the reason I'm not getting this blessing is because I didn't ask for that blessing. Maybe the reason I'm not receiving this is because I didn't ask God for that. Notice in James chapter 4, this is in the context of fellowship with the world. This is what you live like if, you, if you're in fellowship with the world. For example, uh, there's wars and fightings, there's spiritual adultery, there's envy, verse 5. Let's notice it, verse 2. He said, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now go back and put that in context with Jabez. Jabez, notice again, he said, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. The last phrase at verse 10. So God granted him what he requested. Now, a couple of comments to make about James 2. That should not be confused. Asking God should not be confused with thinking or wishing. I think sometimes we talk about praying. That we're praying, but maybe we're thinking that I'm thinking about that and I'm wishing that would happen. Praying and wishing is not the same thing. Praying and thinking is not the same thing. Romans 10 and verse 1 tells me prayer involves talking to God. My heart's desire and prayer to God, the heart's desire is different from my prayer. It's when that heart's desire is expressed to God is when prayer is offered. I might be thinking how I'd like to be blessed. I might be wishing how I would be blessed. But when I take those thoughts and wishes and express them to God, then I've made my request to God. Maybe again, one reason that we're not being blessed in some areas is we're not asking. His first request was, bless me indeed. But let's go again to the prayer. Here's the second thing he mentioned. Bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. His second request was enlarge my territory. It's not a selfish request to have that what others have. He's not saying I want to take from someone else. He's not asking I want others to have less so then I can have more. But what he's asking is I want to receive part of the inheritance of that land that was promised. Now, let's go to some Old Testament passages where a similar phrase is used. Remember that phrase, enlarge my territory. Let's go now to the book of Exodus, chapter 34. Just want you to see how this phrase is used. And in these contexts, he's referring to the promised land. Exodus 34 and in verse 34. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak, he would take the veil off, and uh, uh, verse 24, I'm at verse uh, 34. Verse 24, for I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders, or some translations will say territory. In other words, this is talking about going into the promised land. God's going to drive the nations out and enlarge your borders, enlarge your territory, a greater inheritance, in other words. Well, a similar phrase is used in Deuteronomy chapter 12, quickly, to Deuteronomy 12 and in verse 20. Deuteronomy 12 and in verse 20, again, that same phrase is used of enlarging the territory. The text says that when the Lord your God enlarges your border as he has promised you, he had promised them the land, and when they drive out the nations, then their borders would be enlarged. In other words, it refers to receiving the land of promise. And it's the same as asking for material blessings. As we saw, bless me indeed, and part of that blessing is enlarge my territory. Now, there is no promise in the New Testament, or old for that matter, of the health and wealth gospel. What's the health and wealth gospel? You turn into the televangelist, and many of them are preaching a health and wealth gospel. You turn to the Lord, and you send a donation to me, and the Lord will bless you richly, and you'll become rich. And if you're not getting rich, you haven't sent enough money. So you send me money, and you're going to get rich. And you're going to have good health. If you're having health problems, you haven't sent enough money. You're not showing devotion to the Lord. Send me money and you're going to have wealth and you're going to have health. There is no promise like that in the 
Old or New Testament. But what God did promise is, if you serve Him, you'll be blessed. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. What are these things? The daily necessities of Matthew 6 and in verse 33. We ought to be asking God to enlarge what He's promised to us. That's what Jabez was doing. You promised the land, enlarge that for me. What's God promised us? Well, He's promised us material blessings. Enlarge my territory. I might pray. He's promised us opportunities. May I have greater opportunities to serve you. May I have greater opportunities to share the gospel. God has given us talents and abilities. I might pray, God, enlarge my territory, enlarge my talents, enlarge my abilities so that I can do more. That I might be like Jabez and be more honorable, be of greater service in the Lord. I might want greater wisdom. God, enlarge my territory. Enlarge the wisdom that you give. James 1 and verse 5. Any lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and he'll give it to him. And I might ask God to increase the influence of our family. One writer said, concerning your family, it's the single most powerful arena you have on earth. Not saying it's more powerful than the church, but you as an individual, the most single powerful arena that you have to be of influence is your family. I might ask God to influence, that increase the influence of my family, that I may be able to influence others, that I might impact others, that I may lead others to the Lord through the influence of my family. Increase my territory. Enlarge my territory. But that's not all he prayed. Here was the third thing. Bless me indeed, number one. Number two, enlarge my territory. And thirdly, that your hand would be with me. Jabez prayed that your hand would be with me. Well, now we find a similar phrase in other passages. Let's go back to the book of Ezra. What he's asking for is God's providence and God's hand of protection and guidance. Let's go to the book of Ezra. In this post-exile period, chapter 7 of Ezra and in verse 9, we see that when Ezra came to Jerusalem, this is where Ezra arrives and Ezra returns. And when he came to Jerusalem, the text says in the fifth month, then on the first day of the month, the text says at verse 9, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. What does that mean? That God brought him there. This was God's providence. This was through God's protection and through God's guidance, he came. His hand was upon him. Well, let's notice another passage where a similar phrase is used, this time in the book of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 4, Joshua chapter 4 and in verse 24, as the text talks about them setting up memorial stones having crossed the Jordan, they've just come through the Jordan, that all the people of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So when they came through, they set up the stones. Why do we need to set up the stones as a memorial? So that everyone will know the hand of our God was upon us. God gave us guidance. God gave us protection. God took care of us. Well, in the first century, Christians could hope for God's hand to help them. How so? Well, look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20. The destruction of Jerusalem was coming, and he said, Pray that your flight be not in winter. That's interesting. In other words, it's going to be difficult in the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. If you're in the city, you may have difficulty getting out and escaping. So pray that when you have to flee from the city, that it doesn't happen in the wintertime. That's God's hand being upon you. That's God's watch care, God's protection, and God's guidance. When we pray, it's a request for God's hand of guidance. You cast your cares upon him because he cares for you, 1 Peter 5 and in verse 7. So when I'm making a request to God, I'm asking him whether I use that phrase, may your hand be upon us. Now let me raise the question, how does he guide us? Well, he guides us through the word. But I may be asking him to help me to understand and see what your word says. And his answer may be letting someone teach me. I may be praying, help me to have a better understanding of what you want me to do. And I hear a sermon and then I'm frustrated over the sermon that tells me how to live better. 
I may pray to God, help me to understand and know better how to live the Christian life. And someone gives me advice and points to the scripture and I get frustrated because they're trying to tell me how to live. But that may have been God's answer to my prayer. God's providing guidance, helping me to understand the word. I might learn from the wisdom of others. In the multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. I might get some wisdom from someone else and God's guiding me and helping me with that. His hand of protection and his hand of guidance is upon me. But that's not all he prayed for. Number one, that you may bless me indeed. Number two, that you may enlarge my territory. Third, that your hand may be with me. But here's the fourth thing, that you would keep me from evil. That you would keep me from evil. That was part of the request that he made, that you may keep me from evil. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus prayed... In the model prayer, lead us not into temptation. In other words, he said, this is how you ought to be praying. This is what I want the disciples to do. I want you to learn to do this. And that is, I want you to pray, lead us not into temptation. Well, God doesn't lead us into temptation, but he allows us to be tempted. And so what it's asking for is, may my temptations be few. May my temptations be less. May they not be so strong. Lead us not into temptation. Keep me from evil. In other words, keep me away from evil influences. Let's look at one of those two passages there. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 31. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses, God through Moses, was warning the people, you're about to embark upon crossing over the Jordan, entering into the promised land. Now, when you do, when you do, there's going to be some evil influences over there. Notice, at verse 20, chapter 31, verse 20, book of Deuteronomy, when I've brought you into the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to give to your fathers, and you've eaten and have filled and have grown fat, then you will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. That's what he said in chapter 6. Beware lest you forget your God. So you're going to get into the land and you're going to have uh, materialism rampant, where you're more concerned about the material things around you and you're going to forget about your God. Same thing is seen in Proverbs chapter 30. I might be that I'm asking God, keep me from evil, keep me away from anything and anyone who would be tempting. Do you remember in Proverbs 5, the warning given to the young man to avoid the harlot, do not go near the door of her house? Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Have nothing to do with her. Stay away from a tempting circumstance. Stay away from a tempting, tempting person. I might need to keep away from those that are not righteous. Go to 2 Thessalonians 3. This is in our Bible study next week. Paul was concerned about the influence of some false teachers. But not only that, he was concerned about some others that may be of detriment to those who were the Thessalonians. Notice in chapter 3 and in verse 2 that he said that that we may be delivered. I'm starting at verse verse 2. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. I want you to pray for us that we may be kept from unreasonable men, because not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Now one of the ways in which that's done is we we grow stronger spiritually, and we're kept away from the evil one. We grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Here's the last thing that he said. Bless me indeed. Number one. Number two, enlarge my territory. Number three, that your hand may be with me. And number four, that you'll keep me from the evil one. And then number five, that I may not cause pain. That I may not cause pain. Now that's an interesting prayer. Have you ever prayed that? Help me, Lord, to be what I should be that I may not cause pain. In other words, as my name prophetically suggests. Remember verse 8 to verse 9 that she called him Jabez and that literally means your footnote will say he will cause pain. That's the way as he grows up he's learning I'm going to cause pain. That's what my name says. That's what my name prophetically implies. So I pray that I may not cause pain as my name suggests. Well I want to suggest evil that he just mentioned in the context and in the prayer. Keep me from evil. Evil causes pain because you reap what you sow, Galatians 6 and in verse 9. 
It's possible to cause pain to others. God would visit the sin under the third and the fourth generation, Exodus 34 says. What's that talking about? The consequence, not the guilt, but the consequence. So here the father sins, but the consequence and the, the, uh, the problems that are created by that sin may influence the son and the grandson and the great-grandson under the third and fourth generation. So it's possible one could be suffering for what their father and grandfather and great-grandfather has been doing. And so sin causes pain. It can cause pain to ourselves. It can cause pain to other people. It's possible that our conduct and our behavior causes heartache and pain to others. Do you remember when um, Isaac and Rebekah's children married? They caused them grief, the text says. Genesis 26 and in verse 35. And so it's possible that our conduct and our behavior is a pain and a heartache to other people. I might cause someone else pain, but someone else's sin and their problem can cause me heartache. Doesn't mean you suffer the guilt. It means you suffer heartache because of that. And so what he's saying is, may I not be the cause of another person's heartache. My mother said that I would cause pain. That's what he's saying. May you help me to be away from evil that I may not cause pain. Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever turned to God and said, God, help me not to be a pain. Help me to live in such a way that it doesn't cause heartache to other people, that I may not be painful to someone else. May I not cause myself pain, my children pain, my family pain. But let's look thirdly at God's answer. I know what the man was like, the text tells us. He was an honorable man. I know the wording of his prayer. There were five elements to his prayer. It was short, but it's it's packed full of information. What was God's answer to his prayer? Let's go to verse 10. Go to verse 10 of our text, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. So, so is an important word in biblical interpretation. Having finished his prayer, so God granted him what he requested. What does that mean? He asked to be blessed, so he was blessed. He asked that his territory be enlarged. That means his territory was enlarged. He made a request that the hand of God be with him. The hand of God was with him. He asked that he be kept from evil. He was kept from evil, and he asked that he not cause pain, and he didn't cause pain. Read again verse verse 10. So God granted him what he requested. What he asked, God God gave. Now you think about that. Everything he asked for. Asked for being blessed, he was blessed. Territory and large hand of God was with him, kept from evil, didn't cause pain. Now you think of what a difference the way his life began and the way it ended. His story turns out quite different. He started out causing pain. And his mother said, he will cause pain. I'll call him that. I'll call him Jabez. And look how his life ends up. He's a man who's serving God. He's more honorable than all of his brothers. And he prays to God and what God has asked God grants to him. How his life turned different. Now, I want to suggest to you God hears and God answers our prayers, which means it's a powerful tool. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. Now, look at that verse again. That's from Psalm 34. Psalm 34 talks about those who fear God. It's one of the twin psalms of Psalm 33 and 34 going together. And they both talk about walking in the fear of God. Come and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And right in the middle of that, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. What that is is a promise. God will hear and he'll answer the prayer. It didn't say God will answer what you ask. The answer may be no. And that may be best. But the answer is, if you're righteous and you fear God, God's going to hear and God's going to answer and God will respond. James chapter 5 and in verse 16 says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, a man like Jabez, who's more honorable than his brothers. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It does much good. We see the same principle in Ephesians chapter 3 and in 1 John chapter 5, 14 and 15. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 5 just for a moment. That God hears, God answers, God promises to respond. 
Never has God promised to respond by giving us exactly what we ask for. The best thing God could do maybe sometimes is tell us no. Or maybe wait a while. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. He hears, He answers. And we know that if He hears us, that whatever we ask, we know that we have petitions that we have asked of Him. God hears, God responds, God answers our prayers. Now let's go back one more time to our text in chapter 4 of First Chronicles. We see the man Jabez, we see the prayer that he offered, and we see God's answer. Let's go back to that last phrase of verse 10. So God granted him what he requested. Has God granted you what you requested? What have you been requesting? What are you asking for? You say, well, I'm not getting some of what I think I should have or what I want, or what I think would be best for me. Are you asking for that? Are you praying for that? Are you more honorable than your family in that you're praying diligently and earnestly as Jabez did? The text says, and God gave him what he requested. There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins. If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?